answer questions. Thank the gentleman for those of you watching at home. Uh, that was not a bathroom break. That was actually a chance for the Democrats to go out and hold a press conference. Uh, ambassador for all the supposed bombshells that was that were in your opening testimony. Uh, I want to get back to the facts of Way. the matter here. And the thing that the Democrats have been unwilling to accept is that their operatives got campaign dirt from Ukrainians in the t in the 2016 election. Now they know it. Here comes the they dossier. They know it's true because we have financial records that show it. So they were the Democrats were heavily involved working with Ukrainians to dirty up the Trump campaign in 2016. So Ambassador, I want to go through just a few of the incidents that we know. Uh, I know you may not know. All about them. You may this know is going to be another now. version uh, but of I walk Devin some Nunes. Of those examples of why the president. Here's a conspiracy theory. Do you know about that? No. Ukraine Here's another one. Do you know about that? that they're a country no. that's out to get him. Do you know about Area 51? I, I do not, that, sir. And Ambassador Volker have said that from that May 23rd meeting. The first. The uh, question I have is, were you aware of the anti-Trump efforts by DNC operative Alexandra Chalupa? I'm not aware of it. There you go. So in 2000, uh, there was a 2017 uh, article that also quotes a Ukrainian parliamentarian, Art Domenko, saying, quote, it was clear that they were supporting, meaning Ukraine, supporting Hillary Clinton's candidacy, and they did everything from organizing meetings with the Clinton team to publicly supporting her to criticizing Trump. I think that they simply didn't meet with the Trump campaign because they thought Hillary would win. Do you know that Ukrainian official by any chance that I don't. stated that? Were you aware that then Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. Chalet wrote an op-ed in The Hill during the 2016 presidential campaign criticizing then-candidate Trump. Not aware. But you know that now after in the last few months. Correct. So probably one of the more disturbing ones is the Ukraine Internal Affairs Minister, Avakov, mocked and disparaged then-candidate Trump on Facebook and Twitter. Were you aware that Sergei Lyshenko, a Ukrainian parliamentarian, admitted that part of his motivation in spreading the information about the so-called Black Ledger, a disputed document purporting to reveal corruption by a former Trump campaign official, was to undermine the Trump candidacy? I wasn't aware. So you may be familiar the Black Ledger was used in the 2016 election to dirty up a campaign associate, uh, and later Mueller didn't use that as evidence in his report on election meddling. So knowing all these facts from high-ranking Ukrainian officials, Ambassador, probably makes a little more sense now as to why the president may think that there's problems with Ukraine and that Ukraine was out to, out to get him. It's not outlandish. Is that correct? I understand your, I understand your point, yes, Chairman. Because you said uh, you said in your deposition, and I'm just going to make sure this was your. Just read it back to you. On page 279 for your legal team, quote: "They are all corrupt." This is your. This is what you said about your conversation with the president. So this is your words about what the president told you. This is the May 23rd meeting. That's correct. They are all corrupt. They are all terrible people, and you know, I don't want to spend any time with that. And he also said they tried to take me down. That's now, correct. When they tried to take him down, I think any logical person that wants to do two plus two equals four games would say that that was in the 2016 election, wasn't it? I believe that's what he was referring to, yes, right. ranking member. So during all this time, and remember, in the spring, the Democrats' Russia hoax wit, uh, witch hunt is still ongoing. They're still claiming that President witch Trump hunt. is a Russian agent. They're out, to get, they're out to get President Trump at the time. His personal attorney is then interested in trying to figure out, OK, 
okay, who are these Ukrainians that are trying to get to my candidate? As those of us, the Republicans on this committee, who are also trying to get to the bottom of who were the sources in the Steele dossier that the Democrats had paid for? The House Republicans wanted to know that all through the spring and even the summer of, and even as of today, we'd still like to know. That's why we've subpoenaed the DNC operatives that they refused to subpoena. We sent a letter this morning. Uh, uh, I doubt Senate, we'll see those subpoenas. The Republicans we controlled this committee exactly for two years, folks, exactly just in case you forgot what happened Who were these Democratic ago, operatives that were dirtying ago. up the Trump campaign in 2016? <laughs> And they just can't get over that the, that the president would send his personal attorney over there to try to get to the bottom of that. And Ambassador, you had very few dealings with Rudy Giuliani, a few text messages. A few text messages and a few phone calls. Right. So the whistleblower trying to put together here with their timeline, they seem to have a timeline problem because the whistleblower that only they know, who they won't subpoena, who clearly Mr. Vindman knows, who they blocked testimony yesterday from and would not allow Mr. Vindman to answer our questions. That whistleblower says on July 25th that there were all these promises being made. Yet the, I forget what they call it, the drug deal that the three amigos were cooking up seems to be their, their latest. You're part of the Three Amigos in the drug deal, Ambassador. Were you aware of any drug deal on July 25th when the phone call actually occurred? I don't know about any drug deal. Right. And did you know you were part of the Three Amigos? I am. I'm a proud part of the Three Amigos. And that's the same thing Ambassador Volker said yesterday. Because by the time the, the phone call that supposedly the whistleblower claims was the reason, was the original quid pro quo, has now got down to, we're now a month later where you're involved and their quid pro quo has gotten down to, it's down to the low level of, well, they want a statement. And you didn't even know about anything to do with, on July 25th, you knew nothing about military aid being withheld. I knew uh, military aid was withheld beginning, I believe on July 18th when Ambassador Taylor uh, told both of us that that was the case. But on July, but you don't know about, you were not on the July 25th call. I was not. Where the aid doesn't come up at all. Uh, again, I just read the readout when everyone else did. In well, we've had everybody's testify that was on the July 25th call, right. that there was no aid discussed on the July 25th call. So then you're in the process. You have no idea that this is tied to Burisma or anybody else. You say you don't realize that until, this, until the end of August. Uh, I didn't realize uh, that aid was tied. Uh, the Burisma in 2016 piece was much earlier, uh, Mr. Uh, ranking member. I'm glad you, you bring up Burisma because this is another issue that the Democrats don't want to go into. They refuse to call in Hunter Biden. Hunter <laughs> Biden could to get to the bottom of all of this. He could come in and talk about whether or not it was appropriate for him to receive over $50,000 a month while his dad was Every vice president. Every board member should have to answer for that. And exactly. When they, they actually were able to stop and get a, an investigator fired. They could call on Hunter Biden, but they don't want to do it. But let's, let's talk about Burisma, Ambassador. Now, I know you're the ambassador of the EU. And I think some of the members later will get into whether or not it was appropriate for you to be in Ukraine or not. I believe it was. I think you have a clear mandate mandate to do it. But you wouldn't be the first ambassador to actually be interested in Burisma. Did you know that in September 2015, then ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, publicly called for an investigation uh, into Slavisky, the president of Burisma? This was the Ukrainian ambassador appointed by President Obama in Ukraine. I wasn't aware of that, no. You were not aware of it? No. So you would not be the first one to be mentioning that investigations should be done on Burisma because it happened during the Obama uh, administration. Did you know that financial records show Burisma routed more than $3 million to the American accounts tied to Hunter Biden? I did not know that. 
Did you know that Burisma's American lawyers tried to secure a meeting with the new state prosecutor the same day as predecessor, predecessor Victor Shokin, who the vice president wanted fired, was announced? Did not know that. Well, we're not going to get to the answer to many of these questions because the witnesses that need to come in and clarify exactly what the Democrats were doing in 2016, you're not, we're not going to be able to visit with those witnesses. And so it's an inconvenient truth that the Democrats don't want to admit their operatives that were dirtying up the Trump campaign using Ukrainian sources in 2016. And they do not want us to get to the bottom of it. They don't want you, Ambassador, to get to the bottom of it. They don't want the president's personal attorney, even though he's under a special counsel investigation, that they fed into the FBI that we've dealt with for over three years. They don't want to get to the bottom of that, Ambassador. I think Mr. Castro has some questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. Good morning, Ambassador. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Castor. Uh, welcome back. You're here all day on the 17th. Dude's late got in the a, night, so thank you for your cooperation with the investigation. A lot of reluctance. Um, did the president ever tell you personally hey about any preconditions for anything? No. Okay, so the president never told you about any preconditions for the aid to be released? No. Uh, the president never told you about any preconditions for a White House meeting? Personally, no. The, uh, you said you didn't have what? your records or your documents from the State Department, but if you did, there wouldn't be any document or record that ties President Trump personally to any of this, correct? Boy, I don't want to speculate what would be no, on Your documents or records? I don't recall anything like okay. that. Okay. No. Good heavens. Okay. Um, you testified uh, Mr. Giuliani's requests for a, pre a, a quid pro quo for the White House meeting, um, and, and you indicated that you believe that was he was evincing President Trump's interests, correct? Uh, Mr. My contact with Mr. Giuliani began, as I said, very late in the process, uh, after August 1st, where, when I was first introduced to him by, by a text but, from Ambassador Volker. Right. So we had already begun those discussions, I believe, with the Ukrainians prior to August 1st, so everything was being funneled through others, including Mr. Volker. Okay. But you testified that Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the president, correct? That's our understanding, okay, yes. But how did you know that? Who told you? Well, when the president says, talk to my personal attorney, and then Mr. Giuliani, as his personal attorney, uh, makes certain requests or demands, we assume it's coming from the president. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not testifying that I heard the president tell Mr. Giuliani to tell us, so if that's your question. Right, but at your deposition, you, you said the question was at the May 23rd meeting when the president said, go talk to, go talk to Rudy. You, you responded, he didn't even say go talk. He said, talk to Rudy. You, you subsequently said it was sort of like, I don't want to talk about this. So it wasn't an order or a direction to go talk with Mr. Giuliani, correct? Our conclusion and the conclusion of the three of us was that if we did not talk to Rudy, nothing would move forward on Ukraine. Okay. And then but that was May 23rd, and then you never had any personal communications with Giuliani until August, right? Uh, that's correct. And Volker was handling, Ambassador Volker was, was he Volker, the primary? Perry, uh, Volker, Perry, and others. Okay. Um, Ambassador Volker, you testified he's a professional diplomat, correct? Yes, he is. Um, and you said you had a great relationship with him? I do, yes. You said he was a very smart guy? Yes. Um, Ambassador Ivanovich said he's a brilliant diplomat, in fact. Do you agree with that? He's pretty, pretty smart. Uh, <laughs> you, you stated that he's one of those people I'd uh, hand my wallet to? I would. Um, and so, did you hear his testimony yesterday? I did not. Okay, because he I didn't... I was busy getting ready for you. He didn't have any, he didn't have any evidence of, of any of these preconditions. Um, and he was the one most engaged with the Ukrainians, wasn't he? Yes. Okay. I mean, you testified and, you know, this was his full-time job, although he was doing it for free. He was the special envoy. Uh, and you testified you came in and out of the, of the events, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, at your deposition, we, we, we asked you about your communications with the president, um, and we asked you whether there were so many 
that it would be impossible to chronicle. Um, and you said, no, it wasn't, wasn't that many. And we went down the path of building a list of communications you uh, remember with the president, right? Correct. And um, we talked about May 23rd in the Oval Office. Yes. Um, you mentioned on July 25th before you went to Ukraine, you, you called the president, but there was no material information on the 25th call, correct? Not that I recall. Okay, then the last Friday, Mr. Holmes uh, came in and uh, I guess his testimony refreshed your recollection? Yeah, what refreshed my recollection was when he, when he uh, uh, mentioned ASAP Rocky, then all of a sudden okay. it came back to me. Yeah. Is that, and talking was, about the, it's not outlandish. Uh, President Zelensky loving the president and so forth? Well, president the whole thing sort of came back to me after okay. he mentioned um, ASAP Rocky. And then the, the next time, you know, we tried to unpack this, the next time you talked with the president was on the telephone was September 9th, according to your deposition, right? I may have even spoken to him on September 6th, but again, okay. I just don't have all the records. I wish I could get them. Right. Then I could answer your questions very easily. Okay, but on September 9th, at least at your deposition, you were extremely clear. You, you called the president, you said he was feeling cranky that day, right? He seemed very cranky to me. And you said, in no uncertain terms, and this is on the heel of, heels of the Bill Taylor text, right? Right. And why don't you tell us, what, what did the president uh, say to you on September 9th that you remember? Well, words to the effect, I, I decided to ask the president the question in an open-ended fashion because there were so many different scenarios floating around as to what was going on with Ukraine. So rather than ask the president nine different questions, is it this, is it this, is it that? I just said, what do you want from Ukraine? I may have even used a four-letter word. And he said, I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. I just want Zelensky to do the right thing, to do what he ran on, or, or words to that <laughs> I effect. don't want anything. I and just want this. the impetus to respond to Ambassador Taylor with the text that I sent. As I said to Mr. Uh, Goldman, it was not an artfully written text. I should have been more specific, put it in quotes, something like that. But Basically, I wanted Mr. Taylor, Ambassador Taylor, to pick up the ball and take it from there. I, I had gone as far as I could go. And you believe the president, correct? You know what? I'm not going to characterize whether I believed or didn't believe. I was just trying to convey what he said on the phone. Okay, and at that point in time, the, the, the pause in the aid, the aid was paused for 55 days. There was a news article in Politico on August 28th talking about it. So by that point in time, the president had uh, been receiving calls from senators. He had been getting pressure uh, to lift the aid, correct? Uh, that's what I understand, yes. I want to turn back to your, your opener on page five um, under w when you talk about in the absence of any credible explanation for the suspension of aid, I later came to believe that the resumption of security aid would not occur until there was a public statement from Ukraine committing to the investigations, correct? Correct. And you acknowledge that this is speculation, right? It was a presumption. Okay. That you, you, it was a guess. In fact, I think you even said this morning. Well, I, I want to say that it, it goes back to Mr. Goldman's point or, or Chairman Schiff's two plus two equaled four in my mind at that point. Okay, but you didn't have any evidence of that, correct? Other than the aid wasn't being released and we weren't getting anywhere with the Ukrainians. Okay, but did Ambassador Volker clue you in that that was the, the issue? I mean, this is a pretty high, um, I mean, this is a, a pretty serious conclusion you've reached without precise evidence. Well, I sent that email to Secretary Pompeo to set up a potential meeting between President Trump and President Zelensky in Warsaw. And when I referred to the logjam, I referred to the logjam in a very inclusive way. Uh, everything was jammed up at that point. And Secretary Pompeo essentially um, gave me the green light to brief President Zelensky about making those, those uh, announcements. Um. Okay, we can, you know, we, we can turn to that. Um, and then that was your email dated what, what date? Do you have the page there? Well, you, your email to Secretary Pompeo. Was, it was August? that August 11th? 
one of these two guys should know what's going on here, folks. 16. Uh, August 22nd. Okay, so you're asking Secretary Pompeo whether we should block time and war. I mean, is there any discussion of specific investigations? Is there any discussion of Biden or Burisma uh, or anything linking to aid in this, in this email that you sent to Pompeo? Secretary no, this, Pompeo? this was a proposed briefing that I was going to give President Zelensky. And I was going to call President Zelensky and ask him to say what is in this email. And I was asking essentially President Pompeo's permission to do that, right. which he said yes. But, but, but at, that, at that point in time, we're talking about investigations into, into the origins of the 2016 election. We're, we're not Bur talking about anything to do with Joe Biden. Joe Biden did not come up. Okay. Um, stepping back a page to your, your email to the State Department on August 11th, um, you email Secretary Pompeo and you say, Kurt and I negotiated a statement from Zelensky to be delivered for our review in a day or two. And the question I have here is that, I mean, that statement never was issued. And in fact, Ambassador Volker has testified that he didn't think it was a good idea and ultimately the Ukrainians didn't think it was a good idea. And so the, the statement never reached a, a finalized um, state. That's correct. Um, but even if it had, it, it, it doesn't talk about Biden's or Burisma or anything insidious, correct? Well, the statement, uh, as, as I recall, would have mentioned the 2016 election slash DNC server and Burisma. Okay. It would not have mentioned the Bidens. And have you heard Ambassador Volker how he talks about what might be an investigation into Burisma? No. Okay. I mean, he has said that if there were... Ukrainians engaged in violations of Ukrainian law, then the prosecutor general with the new administration ought to investigate that. Did Ambassador Volker ever relate that to you? No, we just talked in generic terms about, quote, investigating Burisma. Okay, but it had nothing to do with Vice President Biden. I had never heard Vice President Biden come up until very late in the game. When? I don't recall the exact date, but mm. when it all sort of came together, maybe after the transcript of the uh, July 25th call, I don't know. I don't know the exact date when I made the connection. Okay. Uh, Apparently, a lot of people did not make the connection. Oh, we're all part of the regulars, we'll the, but now the but we're sort of Johnson. also part of the irregulars. He, when he heard about some of these issues in the whole of the aid, he, he, wanted, he called the president. He called the president on August 31st. It's page six of his letter. Um, Senator Johnson um, states, or he writes, I asked him, the president, whether there was some kind of arrangement where Ukraine would take some action and the hole would be lifted. Without hesitation, President Trump immediately denied such an arrangement existed. Senator Johnson quotes the president saying, no, and he, he prefaced it with a, di a different word. Um, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? <coughs> I have, um, Senator Johnson says, I have accurately characterized the president's reaction as adamant, vehement, and angry. Who told Senator you that? Johnson's I mean, yeah, who told you that? It wasn't mm -hmm. a public event. It, it was capturing a genuine, um, you know, moment with the president. And, <laughs> and he had, at this point in time, on August 31st, it meant so much he was to me. adamant, vehement, and angry that there was no connections to, to aid. There were no preconditions. Yeah, I had my meeting with Senator Johnson where, again, I had made the presumption that I had made to both Mr. Yermak and the email I had sent to Secretary Pompeo. And we were sort of ruminating about what was going on. Uh -huh. And Senator Johnson, I believe, said, I'm going to call President Trump you know, and find out. And then he obviously had that phone call. I wasn't involved in that phone call. Okay. But you have no reason to disbelieve that wasn't the way it went down, right? No, no reason to disbelieve okay. Senator Johnson. Um, and now that you've had some time since your deposition and you submitted a, an addendum relating to the Warsaw uh, get together with Mr. Yarmack, 
as you sit here today, I mean, are we missing a lot of your communications with the president? I haven't had that many communications with the president. And in fact, a bunch of the call records that I have had access to, just the short period of time on the call indicates I never got through. In other words, I was put on hold for one or two minutes and the call never connected. So I really can't give you an accurate count of how many conversations. Plus, Mr. Castor, I've had a lot of conversations with the president about completely unrelated matters that have nothing to do with Ukraine. They're corrupt, but they're totally so, unrelated. But you don't think we're missing any material conversations that you have with the president? I, I, I don't recall any material conversations today as I'm sitting here. Or, or with Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, my, my memory about the conversations with Rudy Giuliani, whether they were direct, whether they were conference calls with Ambassador Volker or Secretary Perry, uh, is really vague without seeing the, the, you know, the, the, call, the call logs. Are there any other key fact witnesses that would help us um, you know, get, to the, get to the bottom of whether there was any, any link to the aid and the... Maybe Brian McCormack, the chief of staff for Secretary Perry, who was involved in and out as well. Okay. Um, now, the, the aid was ultimately lifted on September 11th, correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. And Senator Johnson, um, in his letter on page six, quotes the president on August 31st. Um, Ron, I understand your position. We're reviewing it now, and you'll probably like my final decision. So even on August 31st, and this is before any congressional investigation started, the, the, the president was signaling to Senator Johnson that he was going to lift the aid. Lift Sound, the, lift sounds the like it, yeah. Okay. And m most of the other witnesses we talked to, whether it's from the Department of Defense or OMB or... Um, you know, have, have told us that all along during this 55-day period, they genuinely believed the hold would be lift, lifted. Was that your feeling too at the time? I didn't know because every time I asked about the hold, I was never given a straight answer as to why it had been put in place to begin with. That's the way we now, do things. what do you things. know about the Ukrainian knowledge of the hold? I didn't start anything with the wife. <laughs> Oh, that's very vague. Um, I don't know if the Politico article triggered it. I don't know if they were told by Mr. Giuliani. It would be pure, um, you know, guesswork on my part, speculation. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I mean, we, it, during your deposition, you, you testified that you did not believe the Ukrainians believe the, the, were aware of the hold until the Politico article. Yeah, again, I think I, think I testified uh, that I was not clear on the exact dates of when these things, when the light went on. There were a lot of conversations going on with the Ukrainians by a lot of people, so I don't know who communicated what to them. Uh, we have testimony from several witnesses that the president was concerned about foreign aid generally, and so he, was, he had an appetite to put holds on, on aid because he was... Um, trying to be a good steward of U.S. taxpayer dollars. Do you, do, you, do you agree with that? I'm aware that that's been his position on aid and other matters, yes. And are you aware that he was also interested in better understanding the contributions of our European allies? That I'm definitely aware of. And there was some back and forth between the State Department officials uh, trying to better understand that information for the president? Yes, that's correct. And how do you know that wasn't the reason for the hold? I don't. Um, but yet you, you, you speculate that there was, um, you know, a, a link to the, this announcement. I presumed it, yes. Okay. I want to turn a little Nothing is provable. To, How do we uh, even know July that we're here? Meeting. Maybe this is all just my bad dream. Um, the, the July 10th meeting in Ambassador Bolton's office involving Ambassador I'm Going to wake up, Volker. I'm not even president. Just Mr. Danny a bad Lok. dream. Uh, Mr. Yarmark. Ivana, what's going on? It's been on? the subject of some controversy. Um, Ambassador Volker yesterday testified. No it, it wasn't until the end of the meeting. Mr. Danny Look, he said, was going through some, some, real detailed, uh, some real detailed information about some of the plans he had. Uh, but it wasn't until the end of the, the meeting, Mr. Ambassador Volker recollects that you mentioned something general about investigations. What do you remember from that meeting? 
Well, again, I'm not going to dispute Ambassador Volker's uh, recollection, if he, particularly if he had notes. Um, I, I know that the desire to have the 2016 election DNC server in Burisma uh, were already being discussed by then. Again, I had no direct contact with Mr. Giuliani on, on July 10th, but through Ambassador Volker. Mm -hmm. And I probably mentioned that this needs to happen in order to move the process forward. That seemed to be um, the conventional wisdom at the time. Uh, I don't recall any abrupt ending of the meeting or people mm. storming out or anything like that. That would have been very memorable if, if someone had stormed Sunland's out. Sunland's the only one who doesn't I remember said. that. Okay, nobody accused you at that point in time of being involved with some sort of drug deal? No. Did Dr. Hill ever relate to you her concerns about you being involved in a drug deal? Never. Okay. So you were surprised when testimony emerged that she thought there was a, a drug deal going on? I was shocked. Okay. Um, and in fact, after the meeting, you went out and you took a picture, right? Yeah, we, uh, Ambassador Bolton, uh, or his assistant indicated that he was out of time, that he needed, he had another meeting to attend, and uh, we all walked out of the White House. Everyone was smiling, everyone was happy. And we know that he didn't have another meeting nice to attend day. because they reconvened almost all the then same did, people did you, uh, retire in another to place right room? after that. I think... Uh, Secretary Perry asked to use the ward room to continue the conversation. And the real subject that was under debate, and it wasn't a angry debate, it was a debate, is should the call from President Trump to President Zelensky be made prior to the parliamentary elections in Ukraine or after the, the parliamentary elections? And there was good reason for both. Um, we felt Ambassador Perry, Ambassador Volker, and I thought it would help President Zelensky to have President Trump speak to him prior to the parliamentary elections because it would give President Zelensky more credibility and ultimately he would do better with his people in the parliamentary elections. Others, I believe, pushed back and said, no, it's not appropriate to do it before it should be done after. And ultimately it was done after. There was no mention of Vice President Biden in the wardroom? Not that I remember, no. Or any specific investigation? Just the generic investigations. Okay. Yeah. When, when again did, did the, the, the Vice President Biden uh, nexus come to your attention? Very late. Again, I, don't ex I can't recall the exact date. The light bulb went on. It could have been as late as once the transcript was out but it was always Burisma to me, and I didn't know about the connection between Burisma and Biden. And to the best of your knowledge, you never understood that anyone was asking Ukrainians to investigate U.S. persons, correct? Ukrainians to investigate U.S. persons? Right. No. Okay. No. And just to sort of be clear here, ultimately the, the, the aid was lifted, September 11th, um, there was never any announcement by the Ukrainians about any investigations they were going to do, correct? Correct. The Ukrainians never, to your knowledge, started any of these investigations, correct? Not to my knowledge. Um, and um, consequently, these allegations that there was a quid pro quo that had to be uh, enforced before the aid was released, and it never came to fruition, right? I don't believe so. No fruition. <laughs> no fru fru fro. Hashtag no fruition. <laughs> Want to just step back a little bit and can't charge me with bribery with you when it's the attempted president bribery. Had some genuinely deep-rooted concerns about corruption in Ukraine, correct? That's what he expressed to us, yes. Okay, and you, you believed him, right, given his business dealings in the, in the region? When we had the conversation, I did. Okay. And when you first started discussing um, the concerns the president had with corruption, Burisma wasn't the only company that was mentioned, right? It was a generic, as I, I think I testified to um, Chairman Schiff, it was a generic corruption, oligarchs, just bad stuff okay. going on in Ukraine. 
Um, and, but other companies came up, didn't they? Uh, I don't know if they were mentioned specifically. It might have been NAFTA gas because we were working on another issue with NAFTA gas, so that might have been one of them. <clears throat> at one point in your deposition, I believe you, you said, yeah, NAFTA gas comes up at every conversation. Is that fair? Probably. Okay. You had, um, I guess Dr. Hill at one point attributed to you the terminology that the president has given you a large remit. You familiar with her uh, assertion of that? I didn't understand what she was talking about. Okay. Um, but but you, you, you have, and we got into this a little bit in your, your deposition, um, you know, you said that the president gave you a special assignment with, with regard to Ukraine, correct? Well, when the president appointed me to the U as the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, Ukraine was part of my portfolio. What made my assignment larger than just being part of my portfolio were the unique circumstances where there was no current sitting ambassador in Ukraine and uh, there was a new president in Ukraine. And the discussions that we had, the three amigos, Perry, Volker, and I, was that Ukraine needed extraordinary, as high a level support as it could get from the United States during this period, which we cleared with both Ambassador Bol Bolton and with Chief of Staff Mulvaney to continue working on it. So by extension, yes, if, if the National Security Advisor and the Chief of Staff approve your remit, it really is coming from the President. Okay. When we asked you that at the deposition, you said I was spinning a little bit. I was spinning about something else, I think, in the, our, in the interview in, in Kiev. Okay. Um, and you further testified, so when I said the President gave me an assignment, it, it wasn't really the President, it was the Secretary through the President. Um, and and that, that's where I received my direction, correct? Correct. Okay. Did Ambassador Taylor ever bring any concerns to your attention about the so-called uh, the channel he dubbed the irregular? No, in fact, the opposite. Um, when he Said came it was to too post, regular. I think I know I called him, or he called me. I think he spoke with uh, Secretary Perry and, and Ambassador uh, Volker separately. And in the course of the first few weeks, he was highly appreciative that a new ambassador coming to post like, like himself was getting the kind of support he was getting from all three of us, having a cabinet member, a special envoy, and a, a fellow ambassador all helping to raise the profile of Ukraine. He was highly appreciative and highly complimentary. And you maintained an open, open line with him, correct? Correct. I think uh, there are a number of texts, some of which I have and some of which I don't, where he is reaching out constantly to me and to the others for advice and help. Okay, we had, uh, I think, tried to count them up. There's a 215 or something text messages between you, um, Volker, and Ambassador Taylor, um, you know, during the, the um, early August time frame. Does that, does that make sense to you? Is that? Yeah, I think, he's, I think Taylor started in late June or early July was when he first took post, and I think we began communicating fairly shortly thereafter. Okay, and he, he never communicated any concerns uh, to you during this time frame that, that he, he had issues with what was going on? What do you mean by what was going on? This um, re request for some sort of investigation. Not in the early stages. He, you know, as, his, as, as time went on, his- Request for some sort of investigation. Not in the early stages. He, you know, as, his, as, as time went on, his emails began to be a little more pointed and frantic. Uh, and that's when we had very li right. little visibility as to what was going on either. I think it had to do more with the aid and as to why the aid was suspended. Right. And, and ultimately, you um, put a period on that issue by having the September 9th communication with the president, correct? That's correct. And when you shared that feedback with Ambassador Taylor, was, was he satisfied that this issue is now behind him? I don't really know because he responded when I said, you know, get a hold of the secretary. Uh, he said, I agree. And I never okay. knew, knew whether he reached out to the secretary or not. Okay. That was sort of the end of that. At one point in your text, you said, let's get on the phone, right? And you said you're a, 
uh, an individual that doesn't <laughs> like to walk through these issues on text when you can talk about it on the telephone, correct? I say that to everybody when something becomes more substantive than just a few lines of text. I say, let's talk. Okay. And did you talk with Ambassador Taylor? I, I don't recall. Okay. I mean, I don't recall whether we spoke right after that, whether he Never called the secretary. Never put it in I, writing. I, basically, Mr. Castor wanted to get the notion across that I've gone as far as I can go with this. You, you need to pick up the ball. You're the ambassador. You need to pick up the ball and run with it at this point. Okay. Um, just getting back to the irregular channel, did anyone else express any concerns to you about this so-called irregular channel? I'm not sure how someone could characterize something as an irregular channel when you're talking to the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, the Chief of Staff of the White House, the Secretary of Energy. I don't know how that's irregular if a bunch of except for the uh, only person who knew what was really going on, according to Sundling, was Rudy Giuliani grieved for some reason for not being included. I don't know how they can consider us to be the irregular channel and they to be the regular channel when it's the leadership that makes the decisions. And so the, the concerns, you know, raised were never brought to. Um, were never brought to a head. Well, they were never raised. Okay. They were never raised. No one said, back off of Ukraine, this is dangerous, you're doing something that's untoward, we have concerns, there was a bad phone call on July 25th, there's talk about a drug cocktail or something. No one ever said that to me by phone, by text, by email. I don't remember anybody sounding any alarm bell because of course had someone mentioned it i would have sat up and taken notice um everyone's hair was on fire but no one decided to talk to us you you know when you when you talk in your statement about in the absence of any credible explanation for the suspension of aid i, I later came to believe uh, it was your speculation it was your guess uh, that the resumption of security aid would not occur uh, until there was a public statement from Ukraine committing to the investigations of 2016. And I, I believe you said that at this point, you believed everyone, everyone knew, knew this. Is that correct? I think once that Politico article broke, it started making the rounds that, you know, if you can't get a White House meeting without the statement, what makes you think you're going to get a Okay. You know, four hundred million dollar check. Again, that was my presumption. Okay, but but you had no evidence to prove that, correct? That's correct. Um, you know, you, you stated that you haven't been able to access your your records. Is that correct? Not all of them, and there are lots of notes, <coughs> records, readouts of calls. Can't get to them. And but you've also stated that you don't. Take notes, right? I don't take notes, but there are a lot of others out there. Um, <laughs> and you, you freely Oops. admit that you, you, you know, when last mm -hmm. thing I asked at your deposition, we, we put together a list of all the times you said you don't recall. It's like two pages long. Um, so Is that all? Uh, I had a bad memory you know, you then. <laughs> on a lot of these questions, I mean, there's nuance, there are ambiguities, uh, and we don't have records, we don't have notes, and we don't have recollections, correct? Right. I mean, it's, it's situational things that sort of trigger memory, especially when I'm, you know, I'm dealing with the <laughs> like European it's Marcel Union. Proust. I'm dealing with the 28 member countries. I'm dealing with other countries that are not in the European when Union. When you're staring at prison, a lot of things I'm come to mind. The, White House the macaroon reminded There's him of childhood. <laughs> and as I said in my, in my uh, opening statement, Rosebud. a phone call... <laughs> For me, with the president of the United States or the president of fill-in-the-blank country, while people who get a call like that maybe once in a lifetime, a call like that might be very memorable. They might remember every single day. So all of these calls, these meetings with very important people tend to sort of blend together until I have someone that can show me what we discussed, what the subject was, then all of a sudden it comes back. I mean, we're trying to get to the facts here. We're trying to find out what actually happened, what's reliable, what's accurate. Uh, Bill Taylor kept notes. He, he brought a little notebook in his pocket at his deposition and he held it up and he says, when I'm at, not at my desk, 
and I'm on the phone, I use this notebook. When I'm at my desk, I use um, a notebook. Uh, George Kent said he wrote just innumerable uh, memos to the file. Catherine Croft, she testified that she didn't believe George Kent's notes would be accurate. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we, we have all this, you know, back and forth, but, you know, as, it, as we get to the end here, you don't have records, you don't have your notes, because you didn't take notes, you don't have a lot of recollections. I mean, this is the, the, like the trifecta of unreliability. Isn't, isn't that true? Well, <laughs> what I'm trying to do today is to use the limited information I have to be as forthcoming as possible with you and the rest of the committee and as these recollections have been refreshed by subsequent testimony, by some texts and emails that I've now had access to, um, I think I filled in a lot of blanks. But a lot of it's speculation. A lot of it is your guess, and we're talking about you know, an impeachment of the President of the United States. So the, the evidence here ought to be pretty darn good. I've been very clear as to when I was presuming, and I was presuming on the aid. On the other things, uh, Mr. Castor, I did have some texts that I, I read from. So when it comes to those, I'll rely on those texts because I don't have any reason to believe that those texts were, you know, falsely sent or that there's some subterfuge there. They are what they are. They say what they say. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. We'll now move to a, a second staff-led round of 30 minutes. Um, Mr. Volker, um, I just have a few questions before I turn it back to Mr. Goldman. You testified uh, in response to my colleagues in the minority, something along the lines of, a lot of people did not make the connection between Burisma and Biden. I think a lot of people have real difficulty understanding that. Um, Tim Morrison testified that I think it took him all of doing a Google search to find out, oh, this is the significance of Burisma. It involves the Bidens. Um, are you Sunland saying during all this time notes, up until the never call, Googled. you never made the connection between Burisma and the Bidens? You just thought that the president and Rudy Giuliani were interested in this one particular Ukrainian company? Again, my role, uh, Mr. Chairman, was just to get the meeting. Well, and I understand that, but my question is, are you saying that for months and months, notwithstanding everything Rudy Giuliani was saying, put Burisma together with the Bidens? I didn't, and I wasn't paying attention to what Mr. Giuliani was saying on TV. We were talking to him directly. Let me ask, let me ask you this. Uh, Ambassador Volker testified yesterday to a similar epiphany, for lack of a better word. Um, this is what he said. In hindsight, I now understand that others saw the idea of investigating possible corruption involving the Ukrainian company Burisma <laughs> as equivalent to investigating former Vice President Biden. I saw them very different, as very different, the former being appropriate and unremarkable, the latter being unacceptable. In retrospect, I should have seen that connection differently, and had I done so, I would have raised my own objections. Does that sum up your views as well? It does. That's a coincidence. Um, they both had the same now, view. <laughs> That's weird. I think you were asked a question uh, with, a, with a bit of an uh, incorrect premise by my colleagues in the minority about Fiona Hill saying that, uh, uh, referring to a drug deal uh, between uh, you and Mr. Mulvaney, it was Ambassador Bolton who made the comment um, that he didn't want to be part of any drug deal that Ambassador Sondland and Mulvaney were cooking up. Um, no one thinks they're talking about a literal drug deal here or a drug cocktail. Uh, the import, I think, of the ambassador's comments is quite clear that um, he believed that this bargain, this quid pro quo, as you've described it over a meeting, um, uh, the investigations to get the meeting was not something he wanted to be a part of. Um, what I want to ask you about is, he makes reference in that drug deal to a drug deal cooked up by you and Mulvaney. Um, it's the reference to Mulvaney that I want to ask you about. Um, you've testified in, that Mulvaney was aware of this quid pro quo, of this condition 
that the Ukrainians had to meet, that is, announcing these public investigations to get the White House meeting. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people were aware of it. Um, and In including, about, <laughs> including Mr. Mulvaney? Correct. Um, and including the Secretary of State? Correct. Um, now, have you seen the, the Acting Chief of Staff's press conference in which he acknowledged that the military aid was uh, withheld in part because of a desire to get that 2016 investigation you've talked about? I don't think I saw it live. I saw it later. Yeah. So you saw him acknowledge publicly what you have confirmed, too, that Mr. Bulvaney understood that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is that right? Well, again, I didn't know that the aid was conclusively tied. I was presuming he was in a position to say yes it was or no it wasn't because... And he said yes it was, did he He not? said yes it was. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you again, Ambassador Sondland. Um, we do appreciate your efforts to refresh your recollection through the documents, and, and we understand we share your frustration in not having the documents to help guide this investigation. Um, so we do appreciate those efforts. One of the documents that you provided to us goes back to um, the conversation you and, and the chairman were having about Mr. Mulvaney. And um, you had been trying for some time before the July 25th call to set up that call. Is that right? To set up the call between President Trump and President Zelensky, yes. Correct, yes. yes. Um, and I want to show you the, an email that uh, you... Um, reference in your opening statement um, that is a, a July 19th email. Um, and who, who is this from? Uh, it looks like it's, is it from me? I don't know. It's from you, I believe. Yeah, it's from me to, and to the group. Now, who is the group? Uh, people mentioned on the email, Blair, Kenna, McCormack, Mulvaney, Perry, Pompeo. And, and who's Robert Blair? I believe he's a deputy chief of staff or a advisor to the chief of staff. And you've already told us that Lisa Kenna is the executive secretary for Secretary Pompeo. Uh, who's Brian McCormack? The chief of staff for, he was the chief of staff for Secretary Perry. Okay. Um, and then we, has, we see Mr. Mulvaney, Secretary Perry, and Secretary Pompeo. Um, can you read what you wrote on July 19th to this group, please? Uh, he is prepared to receive POTUS call. We'll assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation. We'll turn over every stone. He would greatly appreciate a call prior to Sunday so he can put out some media about a friendly and productive call, no details, prior to Ukraine election on Sunday. So Sunday was the 21st, which was the date of the parliamentary elections in Ukraine, is that right? That's right. Okay. When you say, uh, we'll assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and will, quote, turn over every stone, unquote, what do you mean there? I'm referring to the Burisma and the 2016 slash DNC server <laughs> investigations. Later that evening, Secretary Perry responds just to you and Brian McCormick, saying, Mick just confirmed the call being set up for tomorrow by NSC, RP. And then a little later, Mr. Mulvaney replies to all, saying, I asked NSC to set it up for tomorrow. Were these the only responses that you received to this email? I, I don't know. If I, if I have them, I would show them. I don't, I don't know. No one wrote back to you and said, what are you talking about in terms of these investigations and turning over every stone? No, there was a chain, and I don't know if it's part of this email or a subsequent email, where I believe uh, Ambassador Bolton pushed back and said he did not want a call to uh, President Zelensky made by President Trump until after the parliamentary elections. So that would explain why it was moved from the next day, July 20th, to the 25th, right? That's right. But Ambassador Bolton is not on this email, is he? I don't think he is, no. Now, you were asked um, by Mr. Castor if there are any other key witnesses who might be able to help with our investigation. 
And you mentioned Brian McCormick, right, the Chief of Staff for Secretary Perry? I did. Um, you are aware that the committee subpoenaed him, are you not? Uh, I wasn't aware of that. And that he refused to come testify? Are you also aware that Mr. Mulvaney was subpoenaed by the committee and refused to come testify? Uh, I did read that in the newspaper, yes. Are you also aware that Robert Blair was subpoenaed and refused to come testify? I think I'm aware of that. And that Secretary Perry was asked to come testify and refused? I am aware of that as well. So would you include them as well as Secretary Pompeo as key witnesses that, that would be able to provide some additional information on this, on this inquiry? I think they would. Hmm. Now, the, this was not the first time, as you indicated, that Mr. Mulvaney uh, heard about these investigations into Burisma and the 2016 election. Um, is that right? I don't know what Mr. Mulvaney heard or didn't hear. Uh, I think there's been a huge amount of exaggeration over my contact with Mr. Mulvaney. It was actually quite limited. Well, he certainly ind didn't indicate, he certainly indicated a familiarity with what you were talking about in this July 19th email. Is that right, right, because I think Mr. Mulvaney was in the May 23rd um, briefing with President Trump. I don't remember because there were people sitting behind us that were coming and going mm -hmm. when we were sitting in front of President Trump's desk. Okay. Now, you've said that you don't have a recollection of, of um, saying, referencing Mulvaney in the July 10th meeting in Ambassador Bolton's office. Is that, is that right? Or? Uh, I, I don't recall. Um, so when both Fiona Hill and Colonel Vindman testify that in response to a question from Ukrainian officials at that July 10th meeting about scheduling a White House visit, that you said, well, I, I spoke with Mr. Mulvaney, and it will be scheduled after they announce these investigations. Do you have any reason to dispute that characterization? I don't have any reason to agree or dispute. I just don't remember. So if they both remembered it, and they both then went and spoke to the NSC legal advisor about it, you would trust that whatever they relayed to the NSC legal advisor would likely be well, an accurate reflection? Again, I, I trust that they related to the NSC legal advisor. I don't, I don't know whether I said it, uh, and I don't know which conversation. Again, I've, I've had very, very limited conversations with Mr. Mulvaney. This email indicates that you spoke to President Zelensky and were relaying what he said to very senior officials. Is that right? Which email again? Sorry, the July 19th email, where you say, I, the subject is, I talked yes. to Zelensky just now. I've got it. Um, was there some sort of assurance that President Zelensky needed to provide about what he would say to President Trump in order just to get the phone call? <clears throat> I think that part was verbal, and then there were a lot of communications going around back and forth with the Ukrainians, and that's when someone, and I don't remember who, came up with the idea of a draft statement so there would be no misunderstanding about what, in fact, the Ukrainians would say and would be willing to say that we could rely on and negotiate something on a piece of paper. So just to place you in time, we're going to get to that draft statement, which was in August. This is July 19th, before the July 25th call. Do you remember whether there was a need from any of the White House officials or other national security officials for President Zelensky to provide some assurance of what he would say to President Trump before a phone call, not the meeting, but a phone call was scheduled? There was initially apparently a condition, but that condition was obviously <coughs> dropped because the phone call took place and there was no such statement made. The phone call took place, as you said, on the 25th of July. And when you say there was no such statement that took place, what do you mean? Well, the Ukrainians never made their public statement prior to the phone call on the 25th of July. Right, but we're not talking about a public statement. I, I, what I was asking is whether President Zelensky needed to relay to you or the other American officials that he would assure President Trump <clears throat> that he would do these investigations in a phone call. That well, is, 
in my email, I obviously had just spoken with him, and he, he, he being Zelensky, and he said that he was prepared to receive the call and he would make those assurances to President Trump on that call, and then presumably that would then lead to the White House meeting. And you had been discussing this phone call for quite, for several weeks now, is that right? Yes, with, I think, with uh, Volcker, with Perry, with uh, uh, Giuliani through Volcker and Perry. And then right after you sent this email assuring the others that he will discuss the investigations and will turn over every stone, the Burisma in 2016 election investigations, Mr. Mulvaney responded that he asked to set up the call for the next day. Is that right? That's what it says. Now, let's go to that press statement that you were discussing in, in August. And you testified, I believe, that um, you understood that Rudy Giuliani was representing the president's interests with regard to Ukraine. Is that right? That's what we all understood. And when you all, who do you mean we all? Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volker, myself. In August, you and Ambassador Volker were coordinating with Andrei Yermak, the Zelensky aide, about a, a press statement. And I want to uh, pull up uh, some of the text exchanges that you were referring to, which, as you acknowledge, uh, helps you refresh your recollection. Is that right? And I think Taylor was involved in those initial discussions as well. Well, he's not on any of these text messages, so uh, perhaps he was. He, he does not remember that. Um, but let's go to the first one. Is it working? On uh, August 9th. There's an exchange between Ambassador Volker and you where you are uh, discussing setting up, we'll try to bring it up in a second, but I'll, I'll just summarize for you. You're discussing trying to set up um, a, a White House meeting, here it is, um, and you say uh, Morrison ready to get dates as soon as Yermak confirms. Mr. Volker, or Ambassador Volker says, excellent, how did you sway him? You said, not sure I did, I think POTUS really wants the deliverable. What did you mean there? the commitment to do the investigations. And how did you know that the president wanted the deliverable? I don't recall. I may have had a conversation with him or I may have heard it from someone else, but I, I don't recall, again, without all these records. Never did Going this. to the next um, exhibit, exhibit 10, where, um, or August 10th, rather. Uh, this is between you and, and Andre Yermak. Um, what did you say initially? in this exchange? Hello, good, my propo oh no, that's Yermak. How was your conversation? And uh, Mr. Yermak responds, hello, good, my proposal, we receive date, and then we make general statement with discussed things. Once we have a date, we'll call for a press briefing announcing upcoming visit and outlining vision for the reboot of US-Ukraine relationship, including among other things, Burisma and election meddling and investigations. And you respond, got it. That was your understanding of what this statement had to say to satisfy Mr. Giuliani, is that right? Yes. And then ultimately to satisfy the POTUS deliverable? Yes. Now, the next day you write an email um, to Ulrich Breckbull and uh, Lisa Kenna. Um, are you able to, to see that on your Yeah, I can see screen? it on the screen, yeah. Okay, what is the, the subject of the email? Uh, Ukraine. And can you read um, what you wrote there? Mike, and I'm referring to Secretary Pompeo, uh, Kurt and I negotiated a statement from Zelensky to be delivered for our review in a day or two. The contents will hopefully make the boss happy enough to authorize an invitation. Zelensky plans to have a big presser on the openness subject, including specifics next week. And in your opening statement, you said that the specifics, ref, re, what did the specifics represent? The, the 2016 and the Burisma. And when you say the boss, who do you mean by that? President Trump. And the invitation is what? The, to the White House meeting. And Lisa Kenner responds, Gordon, I'll pass to S. And S is Secretary Pompeo? Correct. Thank you, Lisa. 
Now, two days later, um, you have a text exchange with Ambassador Volker again. Um, and this is at the end of it, but it in, the earlier text, uh, which we don't have here, you may recall includes the press statement, the revised press statement that includes Burisma and the 2016 election. Is that, do you recall that? Yes, if I could see it, that would be <clears throat> helpful, but yes. Um, so, but you ultimately remembered that after your conversation with Mr. Giuliani, you did pass along a statement to the Ukrainians uh, that included Burisma in the 2016 election, is that right? I think there were statements being passed back and forth between Volker, the Ukrainians, and others to try and negotiate acceptable language. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that statement was not issued, was it? Correct. And the White House meeting w did not? Still hasn't occurred. Still hasn't occurred. <laughs> But you certainly understood at that time, did you not, that it was the president's direction and instruction that a White House meeting with President Zelensky would not occur until President Zelensky announced publicly the investigations that the president wanted. Is that right? That's correct. And you now know that the pre investigations the president wanted or is an investigation into the Bidens and an investigation into the 2016 election? I know that now, yes. I'm going to move ahead to Democracy August now reporting Pompeo's planning to resign. And oh, he's trying to get to Kansas. wrote an email to Secretary Pompeo, directly to Secretary Pompeo, CCing Lisa Kenna, Her time the subject of Zelensky. Coincidence. And could you please read what you wrote to Secretary Pompeo? Uh, Mike, should we block time in Warsaw for a short pull aside for POTUS to meet Zelensky? I would ask Zelensky to look him in the eye and tell him that once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place mid-September, Zelensky should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to POTUS and to the U.S., Hopefully that will break the logjam. And Secretary Pompeo responds to you three minutes later, yes. The logjam. Now, the, I want to unpack this a little bit. Didn't come to fruition. Um, you said that <laughs> in the middle, once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place, what did you mean by that? The new prosecutor that was going to be working for President Zelensky, the old prosecutor, I believe his term was up or he was being let go. Uh, he was the Poroshenko prosecutor, and uh, Zelensky wanted to wait until his person was in place. So once that new prosecutor was in place, then Z, President Zelensky, should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to POTUS. What did you mean by those issues of importance to POTUS? Again, the 2016 election and Burisma investigation. Were you aware at this time that Secretary Pompeo had listened in to the July 25th phone call? I was not. If he had, do you believe that he would fully understand what the issues of importance to POTUS related to Ukraine would be? I mean, I can't characterize his state of mind. He listened in on the phone call and he concluded what he concluded. But now that you've read the phone call, it's quite clear what the issues of importance to POTUS are. Yes. Biden investigation and yes. the 2016 election investigation. Is that right? That's correct. Then it says, hopefully, that will break the log jam. Now, by this point, you were aware that security assistance had been on hold for about five weeks. Is that right? I became aware on the 18th of July. And you understood that there was a lot of activity within the State Department and elsewhere to try to get that hold lifted, is that right? That's right. Just about everybody in, in the interagency, meaning the national security apparatus, wanted to lift the hold and wanted the aid to go to Ukraine? Correct. So what did you mean here when you said logjam? Well, as I said to Chairman Schiff, uh, I meant inclusively anything that was holding up moving forward on the meeting and, and uh, the Ukraine-US relationship. And what was holding that up? At that point, it was the statements uh, about uh, Burisma and the 2016 elections. But what was being held up? Well, the aid was being held up, obviously. 
four days later, you said in your opening statement that you sent Rudy Giuliani's contact information to John Bolton. Is that right? I did. Did you know why he asked for that? No idea. Did you know that he was going to Ukraine the next day? Uh, I knew he was about to go to Ukraine. I didn't know exactly when his trip was, but I thought it was kind of an odd request. Tell the mustache the where you can get the drugs get anyone's Ukraine. phone number they want. Now, in this email to Secretary Pompeo, you refer reference a trip to Warsaw. Ultimately, the vice president went on that trip? That's correct. And that was the conversation that you talked about, um, where you, just, you testified earlier to that, where you said that we really need to get these uh, investigations from Ukraine in order to release the aid in the pre-meeting? That's right. And Vice President Pence just nodded? He, he heard what I said and didn't respond in any way? I don't recall any substantive response. Okay. Um, but you, you never specifically referenced the Bidens or Burisma in that meeting, did you? I don't remember ever mentioning the Bidens. I may have mentioned Burisma. And that meeting you, was uh, with a group. You were not alone with Vice President Pence. That's that right. Um, and you know that at that bilateral meeting with President Zelensky, I believe you testified earlier, that Vice President Pence did not mention these investigations at all, right? I don't recall him mentioning the investigations. So that your testimony is just simply in a pre-meeting with a group of Americans before the bilateral meeting. You referenced the fact that Ukraine needed to do these investigations in order to lift the aid. I, right? I think I referenced, I didn't say that Ukraine had to do the investigations. I think I said that we heard from Mr. Giuliani that that was the case. So that helped inform your presumption, correct? Correct. So it wasn't really a presumption. You heard from Mr. Giuliani. Well, I didn't hear from Mr. Giuliani about the aid. I heard about the Burisma in 2016. And you understood at that point, as we discussed, 2 plus 2 equals 4, that That's the right. aid was there as well. That was the problem, Mr. Goldman. No one told me directly that the aid was tied to anything. I was presuming it was. Good right. job, Rudy. Well, I want to go no quid ahead to, no um, I'm going to go back on September 1st, or I'm going to jump actually ahead to, uh, to September 7th, OK? When we discussed those text messages where you said there were multiple convos with President Zelensky and POTUS, you recall that? Do you have the email by any chance? Uh, we could try to pull it up in a second, but you don't remember I showed it to you yeah, earlier this morning? Yeah, go ahead, though, with your question. Um, and you, you confirmed that that likely meant, as you said it did, that you spoke with President Trump. Is that right? Again, if my email said I spoke with President Trump, presumably I, I did. You, you are relying pretty heavily in your testimony on the texts and emails that you were able to review, is that right? That's right. So certainly if someone else had contemporaneous texts, emails, or notes, you would presume that what they were saying was accurate, is that correct? Well, if they had texts or emails, I would. If they had notes, I don't know. Some people's notes are great, some people's aren't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly it would be a helpful refresher to anyone's memory. Including my own? Now, you had a conversation on September 7th, according to both Ambassador Taylor and Tim Morrison, with Tim Morrison, where you told Mr. Morrison that President Trump told you that he was not asking for a quid pro quo, but that he did insist that President Zelensky go to a microphone and say that he is opening investigations of Biden and 2016 election interference and that President Zelensky should want to do this himself. You don't have any reason to dispute both Ambassador Taylor's and Mr. Morrison's testimony about that conversation, do you? No. On September 8th, you then had a conversation directly with Ambassador Taylor about this same phone call, where Ambassador Taylor said that you confirmed that you spoke to President Trump, as he had suggested earlier to you, and that President Trump was adamant that President Zelensky himself, meaning not the prosecutor general, had to, quote, clear things up and do it in public, unquote. Do you recall, you don't have any reason to think that Ambassador Taylor's testimony based on his contemporaneous notes was... I don't incorrect. know if I got that from President Trump or I got it 
from Giuliani. That's the part I'm not clear on. Well, Ambassador Taylor is quite clear that you said President Trump. Mr. Morrison is also quite clear that you said President Trump. You don't have any reason to dispute their very specific recollections, do you? No, if they have notes and they recall that, I don't have any reason to dispute it. I just personally can't remember where I got it from. And then you, you also told Ambassador Taylor in that same conversation that if President Zelensky, that rather you told President Zelensky and Andrei Yermak that although this was not a quid pro quo, as the President had very clearly told you, it was, however, required for President Zelensky to clear things up in public or there would be a stalemate. You don't have any reason to dispute Ambassador Taylor's recollection of that conversation you had with President Zelensky, do you? No. And that you understood the stalemate referenced the aid, is that correct? At that point, yes. Ambassador Taylor also described a comment that you made where you were trying to explain what President Trump's view of this was. And you said that President Trump is a businessman. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asked the person to pay up before signing the check. Do you recall saying that to Ambassador Taylor? I don't recall it specifically, but I may have. And Ambassador Volker also said that you did. Okay. So just to summarize here, by the end of the first week of September, before the aid had been released, you had expressed twice to the Ukrainians that you understood that the aid that the investigations needed to be publicly announced on CNN in order for the aid to be released. Do you recall that? I didn't say that they had to be announced on CNN. The Ukrainians said to me or to Ambassador Volker or both of us that they had planned to do an interview anyway on CNN and they would use that occasion to mention these items. And that even though at some point you had calculated two plus two to equal four, and therefore you believed that the aid was conditioned on the investigations, that you had a phone call with President Trump that you relayed to both Tim Morrison and Ambassador Taylor, whose accounts of that conversation you do not dispute, where President Trump confirmed that President Zelensky needed to publicly announce the investigations, or otherwise the obvious implication of the stalemate would be that the aid would not be released. Is that correct? Again, the implication, I did not hear directly from President Trump that the aid would be held up until the statement was made. I did not hear those words. But you agree that with whatever Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor testified to about the conversation you had with President Trump, is that right? Uh, remind me again, I don't want to misspeak. Well, you, you just said you have no reason to dispute their accounts based on their detailed notes. Were they saying that I told them that President Trump said that the aid would not be released until the uh, statements were made? Because I said repeatedly, I don't recall President Trump ever saying that to me. Okay. I think what they said, if I could just finish this line of yeah. questioning, yeah. was that President Trump was adamant that President Zelensky himself had to clear things up, quote, clear things up and do it in public, unquote. So what they related was although President Trump claimed to you there was no quid pro quo, he also made it clear to you in that call that President Zelensky had to, quote, clear things up and do it in public. You don't have a reason to dispute. That's what I, you I don't have any reason to dispute the clear things up and do it in public. What I'm trying to be very clear about was President Trump never told me directly that the aid was tied to that statement. But in that same conversation you had with him about the aid, about the quid pro quo, he told you that President Zelensky had to, quote, clear things up and do it in public, correct? I did not have a conversation with him about the aid. I had a conversation with him as referenced in my text about quid pro quo. Well, the quid pro quo you were discussing was over the aid, correct? No. President Trump, when I asked him the open-ended question, as I testified previously, what do you want from Ukraine? His answer was, I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Tell Zelensky to do the right thing. That's all I got from President Trump. Did you also get from President Trump, as reflected by <laughs> Ambassador Taylor, that he said he was adamant that President Zelensky had to, quote, clear things up and do it in public? 
That part I can agree to, yes. Um, time is now with the minority for 20 minutes. I'm sorry, 33 minutes. I want to make it clear, I'm not talking minutes. right now. I'm not talking. I'm not saying words. Not Ambassador, you've been just in said, uh, business for a long time. I deny I'm speaking. You I don't have. hear me because I'm so, not saying anything. And where it should have stopped? If you want to get to the bottom at of the deal stand, what, what they thought about running it. a department or one of your buildings or something, who do you go to? The boss. The manager of whatever company exactly. it is. Right? Correct. So if you want to get to the bottom of foreign aid, probably go to the people that are in charge of foreign aid here in this town, wouldn't you? Because you're not in charge of foreign aid. I'm not in charge of foreign aid. And you've had to testify that you've presumed foreign aid was this or that, and you're guessing that this was tied to foreign aid. But there are people in this town who are in charge of the foreign aid. And in fact, I don't think it's very fair to you at all, or to us, or to the American people, you might be surprised Unfair. that we had that person here in the Capitol, in a secret deposition, in the basement, last Saturday. Now that testimony might be pretty important to you before you're here to testify, if you could have read that, your lawyers could have went through that, because it may have clarified some more things for you about the, about Refresh. Your, recollection about the foreign aid. So, you know, we've heard, earlier we heard about the, we had the chair looking at the cameras telling American people, talking about Watergate with their Watergate fantasies that they continue to, I guess they fantasize about this at night. And then they come mm, here and talk about obstruction of justice. Because they're not giving you documents that you think you, sh you should have. So now they've laid out their clear Watergate argument or articles of impeachment. So I just have to remind uh, the gentleman, we're, we're, I know we're not in a court of law because you wrote the, the rules, the chair here did, but I would think it's obstruction of justice to not give the American people and give the ambassador the right to look at the transcript of the man who's in charge of the foreign aid in this town. Now I could get into what he said, but and he, the chair could release what he said. And we're not even allowed to call that witness here today. So let's talk about things that we do know are facts. Okay, as best as I think you and I and most people know them. President Trump does not like foreign aid to start with. Is that correct, Ambassador? I've heard that, yes. And you've testified that watching over the EU, you have 28 countries, you have neighboring countries that you work with. One of his biggest complaints is the lack of participation that those countries participate in programs around the world. Isn't Bingo, that I don't That's like great. any of it. Especially NATO. Yes. Right? That's one of your, when you start, when you go down the list of the jobs that, that is, when you get directions from the White House, when you first uh, became ambassador, probably one of the number one things, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but on that, the top of the list was making sure countries pay their fair share, especially with NATO. Yeah, and we have a very capable ambassador to NATO, so I'm not going to take her, her lane. But it's one of the, but it you is. work with those countries, it's one of the issues that you bring up in your meetings, correct? Uh, it is. So, now I know you weren't on the July 25th phone call, but one of the First things that the President of the United States brings up is Germany's lack of participation. I think he names the President of Germany directly, that they're not participating in helping out Ukraine, who's one of their neighbors. Is that I've what you read in the, in the transcript? I've heard that, yes. So the whole idea that the President, start, starting out with he doesn't like foreign aid, he doesn't think countries pay their fair share, that's looking out for the taxpayer. But there's more, and we talked about this in your deposition. We talked about it, about how we have requirements. The Congress writes requirements into the law that require you and all the diplomats to carry out the foreign policy of this country for the President of the United States. Before the President can certify foreign aid and send foreign aid, there has to be certification that there's, that there's no corruption. You're aware of that now. I am now, yes. So, 
So being that, that you learned about that in your deposition, now looking back at clearly the challenges and concerns the president had with the involvement of, the, of high level Ukrainian government officials, including the ambassador here in the United States that attacked him during his presidential campaign, the concerns of leaks that were leaks or just made up stories and conspiracy theories that were spun in the Steele dossier that the Democrats on this Steel committee dossier. own. Steel they paid dossier. for it. Other DNC operatives that were working with the Ukrainian ambassador here in, here in Washington, D.C. to dirty up your boss, the President of the United States. We're not going to hear from those witnesses. Just like we're not going to hear from the person we deposed on Saturday. We're not going to hear about what the real reason, the person who's in charge of, of making sure that foreign aid is delivered, we're not going to hear about what actually happened with the foreign aid. Wouldn't that have made it a lot easier for you to testify instead of guessing and doing little funny math problems up here? Two plus two equals four. Great for all the viewers to <laughs> hear that. Wouldn't it be easier if you just knew exactly why the foreign aid wasn't given? It would have been easier to testify if I had a totality of the record. And would you trust the person who's in charge of cutting the checks for foreign aid, the top career diplomat or the, the top career official? I'd have no reason not to. Thank you. Well, Ambassador, I don't know if we'll get to, to speak again, if we have some more magical minutes, uh, but I, uh, I'm done with questions uh, with you. I know the rest of our members have more questions. Uh, and uh, let me turn to, I know Mr. Castor has some more questions. Magical minutes. Hello again, Ambassador. Hi. We'll try not to use all of this time as a courtesy to you. Um, just want to go through some. <laughs> they don't have any distinctions extra stuff between to talk your about. Uh, your opener and your deposition, um, and some other witnesses. Um, in your opening statement today, you said President Trump directed us to talk with Rudy. Correct. Correct. But then you and I had a little bit of a back and forth about the president. Just said talk to Rudy, and and. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you took that to mean if we wanted to move forward with these types of things, Rudy was the, the, the place to go? Rudy was the guy. Okay. But President Trump didn't direct you to talk to Rudy, correct? It wasn't an order. It, it was, if you want to work on this, this is the guy you got to talk to. Um, Ambassador Volker in his deposition said, I didn't take it as an instruction, but just as a comment. Talk to Rudy. You know, he knows these things, and you've got some bad people around him. I mean, that, referring to the Ukrainian. Um, so, I mean, he, Ambassador Volker hasn't testified that there's any sort of order or direction to talk to Rudy. I don't know what he testified. Um, it became very clear to all three of us that if we wanted to move the relationship forward, President Trump was not really interested in engaging. He wanted Rudy to handle it. And as I said in my opening statement, Secretary Perry took the lead and made the initial contact with Rudy, and that's when we began working with him. Um, and as to the question of whether Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires specifically of the President of the United States, in your deposition, you said, I don't know. I don't know if this was coming out of Rudy Giuliani, irrespective of the President. Correct? I'm, I, yeah, I'm not going to dispute what I said in my deposition. Okay. That's true. Yeah. And we walked through all your communications with Rudy Giuliani, and they're not a lot, right? Correct. Um, Ambassador Volker, in his deposition, on the same question, said, I did not have that impression. I believe Mr. Giuliani was doing his own communications. And, you know, granted, Mr. Giuliani had business interests in Ukraine, correct? Now I understand he did. Okay. I didn't know that at with, the time. With Messrs. Par Parnas and... Fruman, correct? A lot of new names I've learned. Okay, and you've right. never met with those folks? No. Okay. And then in your September 9th communication with the president, during your deposition, that was a striking moment when you walked us through your telephone call with President Trump on September 9th. You and by the way, I still cannot find a record of that call because the State Department and the White House cannot locate it, but I'm pretty sure I had the call on that day. 
They can't locate it or they won't give Whether it to it was the ninth or the eighth. Yeah. You had this call. It was extremely memorable, right? It was. And and you, you've been very uh, honest and we're not trying to give you a hard time on all the times you don't recall. We're just trying to, to say that there's a lot of important events that have happened that, that the committee's asked you about. And you've honestly said, I don't recall. But the, the call with President Trump on September 9th or the 8th, you recall it vividly, right? I recall it vividly because it was keyed by the sort of frantic emails from Ambassador Taylor. Uh, I had, again, prior to that call, had all kinds of theories as to why things weren't moving, why there was no White House meeting, why there was no aid, why there was no this, why there was no that. And I was getting tired of going around in circles, frankly. So I made the call and I asked, as I said, the open-ended question, what do you want from Ukraine? Right. And, he and was, that's when I got the answer. He was unequivocal, nothing. What I said in the text is what I heard. And I'm curious, did, was that a vignette in your opener today? I don't think so. How come? That's so memorable, it's so striking. I, I don't know, it was in my previous testimony and I assumed if people had questions they would bring it up. Okay, I mean, this is an example, you know, a lot of witnesses during the course of this investigation have dealt with ambiguities in different ways and some have resolved them in the light least favorable to the president over and over again. This is an exculpatory fact sh shedding some um, light on the president's state of mind about the situation about the... You know, and I'm happy to discuss it. So I'm just wondering why you didn't mention it in your I, opener. I, there were so many things I wanted to include in my opening, and my opening was already, I think, 45 minutes or something. It would have been an hour and a half. There are a lot of things I'd like to have mentioned. Okay, but you opinion. only had a couple conversations with the president. And we're trying to evaluate whether the... Uh, there was not, it, was not the president. it was not purposeful, trust okay. me. Um, talking about striking conversations, Mr. Holmes, when he came here last Friday in the basement, um, he, he, I'll tell you, he, he thought your conversation that you had with the president was like the most memorable thing he's ever experienced. He, how many conversations has he had with the president? Hi, I don't know. He probably hasn't had any, um, but he, he was, um, energized, enthusiastic, uh, about telling us about this conversation. And so he, not only did I buy him lunch, but I also provided entertainment. Yeah. And he, I mean, he, he, he conferred with us that he, he, he regaled anyone that he came across with this story. Uh, and that's, I guess, a great discussion for Thursday. Um, but you know, other than the colorful language, and he was definitely moved by, by the color, uh, <laughs> but he was unequivocal that you brought up the Bidens in the post-call discussion. And uh, he said something to the effect of the president's uh, only interested in big things. And Mr. Mr. Holmes said that, oh, there's a lot of big things going on in the Ukraine, like there are. There's a war. Um, Ukraine's under attack uh, from the east by Russia. Um, and he, he puts words in your mouth to the effect of, no, the president only cares about um, investigations like Rudy is pitching about the Bidens. And what's important about this, this is the day after the 725 call. And what's reported by Mr. Holmes, and, and you, the extent you've confirmed it, isn't anything different than happened on the 725 call. Agreed? From well, the president's standpoint? With 2020 hindsight, now that we've had the transcript of the, of the call, the Bidens were clearly mentioned on the call, but I, don't, I wasn't making the connection with the Bidens. Right, but... but with regard to the president, it was just mentioning investigations. That's all he said on the phone was right. investigations, I think. But you told us time and again that you never realized the Bidens were part of any of this, the, the, the Burisma, and you talked about a continuum, and you never came to understand that until maybe as late as September 25th, yeah. correct? I don't know the exact date, but it was pretty late. <laughs> okay. And, and Ambassador Volker said the Bidens never came up after his one breakfast meeting with, with, with Mayor Giuliani, where he, he, he testified that he, he tried to disabuse the mayor of anything uh, relating to the Bidens. And I think Secretary Perry publicly stated um, that he never heard Biden either until 
Okay. The end. So, so when, when you testify here today that you have no recollection of mentioning the Bidens to Mr. Holmes, that's not just a recollection. That's based on your state of mind at that point in time and your state of mind up to you know, September 25th, correct? I wasn't into investigating the Bidens. Okay. So it's very surprising to you that he would mention that, right? It was very surprising to me. I want to uh, go back to a couple things in your statement. Um, this July 26th meeting with President Zelensky, earlier, earlier in the day from this um, lunch time uh, event we've been talking about. During the course of the meeting with President Zelensky, did, did any of the parties discuss uh, what, what came up on the telephone call? I don't believe so. Okay, so President Zelensky didn't express any concerns about the content of the call, right? I mean, all I heard about that call was that it was a good call. It was friendly, everyone was happy, you know. I was Perfect delighted call. to hear that so that we could now move to the next okay. phase, which was the meeting. Okay. So you, you, can, you can tell us with certainty that nobody talked about demands in that meeting or fulfilling the president's demands? I don't remember exactly. Again, this is a, this is a great example, Mr. Castor, of where I would have loved to have seen the notes from the meeting. I didn't take any notes, but I know there were notes taken. But I don't remember any heated conversation in the meeting. I remember it being a really, really friendly, good meeting. And that's why I said what I did to the president the next day, which was, you know, Zelensky will do whatever you want. He's very happy. Um, and you, you don't remember any discussion of the by President Zelensky of lamenting how he had to navigate this this difficult situation, right? I don't I don't know. I know that that was in the whistleblower complaint, something about navigating something. I did. It I was. Didn't, <laughs> I didn't remember anything okay. like that. Um, and I, I want to get back to your the gentleman. Yield a second, of course. Which would be another helpful thing, also, Ambassador, is if we actually had heard from the whistleblower and we had testimony of the whistleblower, then you wouldn't have to be up here speculating as much and guessing because you would have a source that would have been interviewed. We have his complaint. We could have matched it up with your testimony along with the people from OMB that would have made it very easy for you to testify so you wouldn't have to just try to remember all this stuff and chase conspiracy theories around that the Democrats have continued to lay out for the last six weeks, moving from quid pro quo to extortion to bribery to where are we at today obstruction of justice and now back to quid pro quo we wouldn't have to do all that if the whistleblower would have testified you wouldn't have to speculate about what the whistleblower only had in his or her complaint that nobody seems to know it'll back to mr castor thank you mr nunez um, i want to turn uh to your, a couple of times in your, your, your opener, you said everyone was in the loop. And I just want to, you know, the, these televised proceedings, sometimes um, we lose track of, of things. And, and, you know, everyone was not in the loop with your speculation or your guess that in the absence of any credible explanation for the suspension of aid, I later came to believe that the resumption of security aid would not occur without a public statement from the Ukraine. Everyone wasn't in the loop with that, right? Well, the secretary was, because that's why I sent my email. But your emails, let's look at your emails. There's two emails that you sent to the secretary, right? Mm -hmm. Better here? August 22nd? Right, and August 11th? August 11th. Mm. So the August 11th email, we went through this before, I'm sorry to go through it again. Um, you said to, to the secretary, Kurt and I negotiated a statement from Z to be delivered for our review in a day or two. The contents will hopefully make the boss happy enough to authorize an invitation. Z plans to have a big presser on the openness <clears throat> subject uh, next week. A couple things here. This is only relating to the White House meeting, correct? Mm, 
Yes, I believe okay. so. Okay, and this is only, um, this is just investigations generally, uh, making a public statement of openness generally, right? Well, I think by August 11th, uh, Mr. Castor, I think we were talking about 2016 in Burisma. The investigations generally was really early in the... <laughs> okay, but do we know that Secretary Pompeo knows that? I think so. I think... Why? Well, only Why? because I think Ambassador, or I'm sorry, Councillor Breckbull was briefed okay. on all of these things. And by who? Was, by you? Uh, by, uh, I believe, Ambassador Volker, by okay. myself. It's not what he testified to. I mean, did you... Did you, Am Ambassador, or uh, Councilor really Breckbull leaning on incredulity. I didn't know he had testified. No, no, Ambassador Volker. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he didn't testify that he, he briefed Mr. Breckbull. Uh, I mean, th this email to the secretary is, is talking about this statement, which, by the way, I mean, you said Kurt and I negotiated a statement, and the statement never went. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah, Ms. Ambassador Volker said it wasn't a good idea. Mr. Yarmack said it wasn't a good idea. Um, and... But what you're writing to the secretary here is just a, you know, it relates to a generic openness subject, right? Yeah, but I think the secretary, though, was on the July 25th call, which obviously I wasn't on and I didn't know about. Okay, but you used this email to suggest that everyone was in the loop, that like, like security sector assistance was tied to some sort of act by Pompeo the Pompeo was even more in the loop than Sundling, no, no, apparently. No, no, I don't think I said that, um, I don't think I said that this, uh, Assistance was in, involved here. Okay. I think so I was. So, what was everyone in the loop about then? Well, the secretary was Quid in the loop quo. that no, I, um, not, we not had negotiated a statement. Okay. I'm fairly comfortable that the secretary knows that where the statement was at that point. In other words, the 2016 in Burisma, okay. and that um, Lisa passed that along okay. to him and kept him informed. Okay, so we can agree that at this point in time, the secretary wasn't in a loop that there was a conditionality on the security sector assistance. Hold on a second. Are you asking about July 19th, Exhibit 4? I was asking about your email to the secretary on August 11th. Oh, okay. There's, well, on... On July 19th, uh, which the secretary was on, I talked about fully transparent investigation and turn over every stone, mm -hmm. and the secretary was on that. Okay. So but you testified at your deposition that on July 19th, in this continuum you talked about, yeah. at that point in the continuum, it was just a generic investigation. It wasn't anything involving... I think it went... Again, with, I'm not trying to put words in any way. I think it went from the original generic from, you know, May 23rd when we left the Oval Office. We're talking about corruption and oligarchs until Mr. Giuliani started to become involved and then it, then it transitioned into the but Burisma. You hadn't even talked to Giuliani by that time. This is July 19th. Mr. Castor, with all respect, will you allow him to finish his answer? Sorry, use the mic. Will you allow him to finish his answer? Of course, please? I apologize. Uh, we were communicating with Mr. Giuliani through Secretary Perry and through uh, Ambassador Volker. Okay. I wasn't talking to Mr. Giuliani directly okay. until after August 1st. But, but as of July 19th, weren't we still on the, the generic part of the continuum? I don't know. I believe, we were, I believe by then we were talking about Burisma in 2016, to be, to be candid. But, but not Biden. No, no, not Biden. Okay, no. And then Burisma was just turning to Burisma. your email of August 11th. Yeah, got it. I'm sorry, we, we, we just we just dealt with that. August the 22nd. 22nd. Yeah, it's page 23 of your your opener. Yeah, I got it. Um, I think basically Nunez and Castor and really where, decided the strategy um, has to be like we got nothing. Let's just meander you around. Were requesting a pull Make no aside points. for the president. And this is when the president was. He was still going to go. He was going yes. to go. It was before yeah. the hurricane. Um, when right, they, uh, when Castor is done, I would we are probably to going to take a break for a while. Once Ukraine's new uh, justice I think folks are we're going to have testimony probably starting at about 3.30 uh, would Zelensky be my guess at this point. Could be even later. Publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to the president. We're going to be doing debate coverage tonight. Hopefully that'll break the logjam.
at sammycam.majority.fm. We will put that link out. You'll find it on our Twitter feeds, et cetera, et cetera. What? The two investigations. Okay. Um, but but not, nothing to do with, with, with Vice President Biden, right? Not, again, I didn't make the connection. Then. Okay. Um, so I guess I shouldn't have said Biden on the phone. I want to just pivot briefly to the president's concerns about foreign assistance. Mm -hmm. um, under Secretary Hale, who will be with us later today, uh, testified that during this relevant time frame, um, there was a, a real focus to re-examine all federal aid programs. Are, are you aware of that interest of the president? I'm generally aware of the president's skepticism toward foreign aid and, you know, conditioning foreign aid on certain things. I'm generally aware of that, yes. And Ambassador Hale testified, and his testimony has been public, um, almost a, a zero-based concept that each assistance program and each country that receives the program be evaluated. The program made sense that we avoid nation building and that we not provide assistance to countries that are lost <laughs> to us in terms of policy, whether it's because um, corruption or, or, you know, another reason. Um, is that something you were aware of at, at the time? Generally, yes. Okay. And you're certainly aware that the president was concerned about the European allies' the contributions to the region. Exactly why I was involved. Okay. So, you know, as we get down to September 11th, right before the, you know, you're advocating that the, the pause be lifted, correct? But yeah, I didn't think the, I personally didn't think right. the pause should have ever been put in okay. place. Okay. Yeah. But as we get down to September 11th and you're talking with Senator Johnson and, and so forth, um, you don't know with certainty that the genuine reason the president was implementing the pause wasn't because of his, his concerns about the allies or his concerns about foreign assistance generally or I that he wasn't that just trying to for hold the aid as long as he could to see what he could, um, you know, what type of information he could get about uh, those two subjects. Fair enough. Okay. Um, I am really trying to finish up before my, so I can yield some time back. Um, do we have anything else, Mr. I have nothing else. Just to recap, folks, you'll recall that for months and months and months. Thank you. Republicans have been telling us. Back. That, of Germany course, the biggest um, story involving Burisma is Hunter Biden. Uh, but none of these people now could make that connection. Allow, uh, okay. Solen, Ambassador Solon, uh, get a bite to eat. I think the members of the committee might like to get a bite to eat. Uh, and then we will resume with the member uh, rounds of questioning of five minutes. Uh, if we could allow the witnesses to have the opportunity to leave All the right. room first. So uh, they're going to go to break. Uh, we will also go to break. We may not be back uh, for a little bit later. We may not uh, catch the, uh, the the first part of this with the uh, members questioning. Uh, but just uh, to reiterate, you know, uh, Gordon Sunland came up today and basically said there was a quid pro quo. He didn't know that Burisma meant the Bidens until uh, Donald Trump told the world and he became aware of that transcript uh, meanwhile, Donald Trump freaking out today. Um, what, should we play that uh, video? Uh, Donald Trump freaking out a bit. Uh, here is some handwritten, we put uh, on the screen, uh, apparently a uh, close-up photo of his notes that he's written for himself. I want nothing, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo. <laughs> Tell Zelensky, do the right thing, do the right thing. This is the final word from the President of the United States. Uh, that is what he had in his handwritten notes. Incidentally, same pen he used to change the uh, trajectory of that hurricane on the map, incidentally. <laughs> but uh, that Enough aside, sharpies, I, I mean, this? look, the, uh, the bottom line is, is that the only part that Gordon Sundland did not connect in terms of the dots today in his testimony and he brought in a whole nother circle of people who were aware of what was going on. Pompeo, Rick Perry, Morrison, Bolton, 
all of whom were on the call on July 25th. The one who put the cherry on the top of this impeachment Sunday was Donald Trump when he used the words Biden. I mean, it's bad enough to be uh, to to be um, engaging in all of the the quid pro quo he's engaging in, but it's Donald Trump who makes it very clear what he what was the thing that he wanted, and he wanted the Bidens. And so Gordon Sutherland doesn't have to know this. I mean, he knew it uh, subsequent to that phone call. But what's really clear is through Sunland's testimony, everybody on that phone call not only knew that the, the Bidens were in play, but that it was a quid pro quo because Sunland had been informing these people through June and July by his testimony today. So the real question is, what are they going to do with people like Pompeo and Perry and others who clearly were with John Bolton? I guess we'll see. Here is Donald Trump. Was a time where they could have been killed. Hey, did I say that out loud? <laughs> Back in the old days. Oh, wait a second. Uh, here's Donald Unless. Trump. Unless. He did not take a questions today, but he did uh, place a family right strategically over his right shoulder, who uh, I don't know who those folks are, but <laughs> with a kid in a walker. Maybe because I'm working, I'm looking out for the American looking people. Looking out for the American people. Here he is. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly, just a quick comment on what's going on in terms of testimony with Ambassador Sondland. And I just noticed one thing, and I would say that means it's all over. What do you want from Ukraine? He asks me, screaming. What do you want from Ukraine? I keep hearing all these different ideas and theories. This is Ambassador like a table read. speaking to me. <laughs> Just happened. To which I turned off the television. Should I emote more? What do you want from Ukraine? I keep hearing all these different ideas and theories. What do you want? What do you want? It was a very short and abrupt conversation that he had with me. They said he was not in a good mood. I'm always in a good mood. I don't know what that is. <laughs> he just said, now he's talking about what my response. So he's going, what do you want? What do you want? I hear all these theories. What do you want? Right? And now, Page two. here's my response that he gave. Just gave. Ready? You have the cameras rolling? Here we go. I want nothing. That's what I want from Ukraine. That's what I said. I want nothing. I said it twice. So he goes. Oh my God. He asked me the question, what do you want? I keep hearing all these things. What do you want? He finally gets me. I don't know him very well. I have not spoken to him much. This is not a man I know well. Seems like a nice guy though. But I don't know him well. He was with other candidates. He actually supported other candidates. Not me. Came in late. <laughs> But here's my response. Now, if you weren't fake news, you'd cover it properly. I say to the ambassador in response, I want nothing, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo. Tell Zelensky, President Zelensky, to do the right thing. So here's my answer, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Tell Zelensky, to do the right thing. Then he says, this is the final word from the President of the United States. I want nothing. Thank you, folks. Have a good time. I'm going to take um, I feel like I'm selling it. Should we sell it less? Let me read that again. The, I want nothing. I want nothing. I think the... It's an Emmy Award winner. The oh amazing part is that... Um, Oh boy. Um, we what should also stay. These thoughts that say I want something in the middle of night, um, <laughs> they'll lie. Play this, uh, Matt. <laughs> play this. Uh, Claudius, not the, a good guy. The, the thing that you should remember, though, is that exactly after he says, I want nothing, I want nothing, is I just want <laughs> <laughs> do the right thing. Sutherland testified that he said, no quid pro quo, no quid quo, I want nothing. I just want Zelensky to give me the statement. Just what, in general? Um, 
Okay, let's. I think we actually have audio of it. Let's hear. Uh, here it is. We get some. Uh, here we go. We get some audio here. Go ahead. Oh, he brings it here into the barrel. Oh, I see nothing. I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. <laughs> there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I see a resemblance. I thought uh, that was uh, Sergeant Schultz from the um, the comedy about the. POW camp called Hogan's Heroes that uh, I watched every single episode. Dad did not like that show. Did not like that did show. Did not. Said it was very disrespectful. I oh, did I leave unfair. the family? He walks off. Did I leave the family there uh, with the kid with the walker? Whatever. Okay. What is he here for? All right, folks. Why does that kid have a walker? I prefer kids without walkers. I prefer kids without walkers. He's treating him like a jungle gym. All right. So listen, here is the, uh, here is the uh, schedule for today. Um, Obviously, uh, a crazy day. We'll be back later. I, I've got to record uh, some stuff for uh, Ring of Fire. We all got to eat and uh, got to get ready for tonight. Then we'll be back later, probably by 3 p.m. or so, 3.30, pick up with the hearings. Remember, there's scheduled two other uh, testimony, uh, witnesses today. David Hale, the Undersecretary of State, Laura Cooper from the Defense Department. And there's a little Never bit anticlimactic. Trumpers. Never Trumpers. Um, there has been a report that Pompeo is resigning. I haven't seen that uh, followed up anywhere. But there's been talk of uh, Pompeo that uh, he wants to go to Kansas. He's trying to figure out a graceful exit. Uh, I would imagine that's the case. But it also just seems to be untenable at this point that uh, all these documents are being uh, prevented from coming. And it really just comes down to whether the Democrats feel like the timing of the uh, what the timing of this should be. I mean, it really there was the Schiff had a closing statement and we should pull that from yesterday. We won't play it now. But uh, Schiff had a closing statement yesterday that I thought was actually pretty powerful and well done. But there was a moment during it, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, we won't run it now, but um, there was a moment during it where <clears throat> what he was saying was almost sort of begging the question of like, how is it possible that this is the only time they did stuff like this? Like th this is just a, 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 a standard MO for this White House. And the fact is this case the argument here of trump's corruption could be made even stronger if the democrats start to dig into a pattern of behavior that is like this and it's almost impossible to imagine like this is a one-off and this one area we're going to be a little bit corrupt was it too late for them to widen the scope no, they can do it at any time they want. I mean, it seems to me what they could do is prepare an article of, uh, of impeachment uh, from the Intelligence Committee, send it to the Judiciary Committee just based on this, and then move on to the next thing and do another one and do another one. I mean, frankly, I would like to see them to do this all the way to like uh, May or June. Do it right up to the convention so that it doesn't interfere with uh, senators who are campaigning in the primary and it just keeps Donald Trump from doing anything else except for getting out there and, and uh, you know, make it, writing shit. So. I, I want guess. to see more uh, Donald Trump reading transcripts yeah, of himself. Too. Exactly. But it's another right nothing. I mean, that's why impeachment should have started like once Nancy Pelosi got the gavel because he would be dead by now. Well, he would certainly, I think, be a lot more tired. Yes. And, and look, I mean, all you need to do is just look at the news. Like, you know, we went through two or three years where Donald Trump would simply define what the news was. And from a political standpoint, I mean, I think, I hope everybody understands that the... The, the, the premise here, here is that you should hold into account uh, rampant corruption by your president and its administration and lawbreaking. Um, but from a political standpoint, it's also a political process. And there's never been an impeachment. My understanding, even Johnson, the, the Republicans at the time decided... 
we could uh, convict Johnson and, and, and boot him out, but it is better. We are better suited to run against him or uh, in uh, in the election, and that's why Johnson was not impeached by one vote. I think that's why it became came down to one vote in the Senate because they decided we don't want to kick him out. It's a political process. It's always been that case. It's been that way for 150 years. Um. I saw someone tweeted, I think it was a non uh, Giardatis who said, you know, we should be impeaching uh, uh, Pence and Pompeo and uh, Barr. Perry and Barr. And, uh, and then uh, Glenn Greenwald made the point, like, are you advocating that Nancy Pelosi should be uh, put into the thing? And I think uh, no, the answer is no, because I don't think anybody can look at the, uh, the politics right now and assume that uh, anybody who's impeached is going to be removed from office by the uh, Republican-controlled Senate. And uh, so you don't need to advocate for Nancy Pelosi to ascend to the White House. I would, I would not, actually. It's probably not going to be helpful for the election. Uh, but impeachment has value. It does say, I mean, just ask Al Gore whether it has value, whether it, it, it puts a marker in history that someone broke the law. Glenn himself was citing that um, Bill Clinton broke the law when he lied in that deposition about sex. So, I mean, these things exist. They do have relevance. So, uh, all right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple hours. Remember, we're going to be doing live coverage of the debate tonight, and that's going to happen at sammycam.majority.fm. But we'll be back on YouTube in a couple hours to do uh, more of the impeachment hearings. Uh, be back soon thank you for joining us it might take all the strength i got to get to where i want but i know somehow i'm gonna get there i wasn't looking when i just got caught between the truth and the light bar but finding out won't make me feel any better yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I get somewhere.